Hi, and welcome to the Fabulous Cancer Podcast. Today I'll be talking to Kat Cressida, and we're going to talk about her cancer story and being a famous for Disney, Marvel, ESPN, uh, several video games voiceover while being a cancer survivor. So thank you so much for joining the podcast. It's my pleasure. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, who you are, and where you're from? Sure. Um, I'm Kat Cressida, and I'm I live in well, America and in California specifically, Los Angeles, California. Um, I'm originally both raised on the West Coast in California as well as New York, uh, Manhattan on the East Coast. So I grew up in both cities and uh, currently, as you mentioned, work and live in Hollywood, California as a voiceover talent. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Which type of cancer did you have? I had a very rare sarcoma. Um, it's uh, got incredibly high at, uh, odds against survival, so it's considered fatal. It's called dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance. And uh, what made it so uh, especially potentially fatal was where it was located, which was underneath my brain skull cavity and behind my jaw. So it was almost impossible to properly diagnose uh, and also once diagnosed uh, for several surgeons, impossible to actually um, deal with or treat or excise. So uh, it was a very perfect storm of a terrifying form of sarcoma as well as a a terrible placement for it in terms of being able to treat it or, or deal with it. Oh, wow. And which treatments did you have for it? I um, ended up having a very drastic, dangerous surgery uh, that put me under for approximately 10 hours. And uh, they needed to have two surgeons on standby in addition to my primary surgeon, uh, Dr. David Alessi at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. And it required uh, them flying in equipment from Germany because that was the only... um, the only medical community that had the advanced equipment that was necessary to try to get in behind my jaw and to clearly view what was going on during the surgery. And um, I had what's called a bifacial flap. And um, that, that means they basically took skin from another part of my body, grafted it over, um, and basically kind of adhered layers so that it would eventually hopefully uh, heal so that I would not be permanently disfigured in my face. And uh, after the drastic surgery had to have a very severe course of radiation for uh, about nine to 10 weeks, a very, very um, scary version of radiation where I had to be strapped down in a mask to a steel plate so that I would not move during the 30 to 40 minutes of radiation every morning. And then after that, um, had several more months of of healing and rehabilitation to get back movement in my face and my voice. And then every year, I would have to have one or two procedures or or surgeries as follow-up, usually around Christmas time, to uh, remove scar tissue, to ensure that the skin and everything was continuing to um, be an optimal position to keep healing and other procedures and treatments to just help the, the collagen and the skin and everything to just hopefully find its way back. So, um, it's, it's been a lot, <laughs> a lot of, a lot on the path, the eight years back to a wellness. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Uh, so you are a voiceover. What made you decide to start to voice acting? Oh, wow. That's a whole long conversation in and of itself. Mm-hmm. But um, I had always loved storytelling. Um, I'd always loved reading out loud. I'd always loved the uh, the craft of, I think I recognized from an early age that, you know, a, a voice that seemed to really lift words off a page um, was a very special talent and that characters came to life in animation or in Disney parks or in um, 
movies and film and, you know, pretty much every form of entertainment, a lot of it has to do with the voice and um, how that voice, how you experience that voice. And that certain voices made you feel a certain way and that certain ways that you read words that you would deliver words can make you um, feel a certain way and that there was a real craft behind it. So I, I was always fascinated with um, words and speaking and storytelling. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, which kind of voiceover work do you do? Um, I'm very fortunate to do all kinds. Um, there's there's different versions of it, uh, particularly in, in America, but I get to do everything from, you know, retail commercials for like McDonald's or, you know, name, name your favorite brand to, so for TV and, and radio to video games, which is a, a different kind of, um, acting skill set within voiceover to doing animation and cartoons to doing, um, movie trailers and promos, um, kind of, you know, the voice that you hear while watching television that tells you what show is coming up next and sounds very excited and makes you want to keep watching. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. So very lucky to do all, all different forms of it. And one of my specialties, um, is what's called celebrity voice matching, which is similar to impersonation, although, um, it's not meant to entertain. It's meant to actually replace or help substitute in for the actor, the famous actor or uh, character. Uh, so that's a whole other subset of voiceover where they where they need someone to voice double for a celebrity. Oh, wow. Cool. Is it also for like movies and stuff? Yes. Um, so, for example, when they shoot a movie. While they try to record the sound live on set, oftentimes there's all kinds of things that can happen uh, during the shooting. You know, the mic drops or it's muffled or they don't get perfect sound because a plane was flying overhead or it, it can be all kinds of different reasons that they have to replace the dialogue during post-production. Oh, wow. That's super cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> which characters did you voice act for? Oh, a ton. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I know you did uh, voice acting for Didi, right? From uh, Dexter's Laboratory? Yes, that's one of my earlier credits. Um, if someone were interested, they could certainly look up my uh, Wikipedia or IMDb. Mm -hmm. That will list all of my credits. But uh, the ones that I'm kind of, I guess you'd say, more famous for are a lot of Disney uh, parks. Uh, famous characters for example there's a famous character in the, the haunted mansion in america which uh, is called the black widow bride and i'm the voice of that so wow. for millions of disney fans that's a big deal if you're not in america and don't know what i'm talking about that's totally fine that's probably <laughs> very healthy but it's a famous character and uh jesse the cowgirl from toy story um have uh officially done her voice for several projects for Pixar and Disney and um, uh, a bunch of famous video games and characters from different famous video games. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, those are the ones that sort of, I think stand out for people are Dee Dee, Jesse, the black widow bride. Um, again, I think most of what I'm really known for would probably be most known by people who are, oh, and I'm the voice of Elektra for Marvel games. So if you're really into Disney and Marvel <laughs> or you listen to ESPN or watch ESPN, which is the number one sports channel in America, then you'd know my voice. Awesome. Yeah, because like, oh, my God, Dexter um, is literally my childhood. So I was like, oh, my God, this is like incredible. You know, I feel, you know, very honored and happy to talk to you about uh about everything so I'm yeah I just really appreciate it a lot thank you oh cool. thank you um how has voice acting helped you through cancer that is a good question and it's much deeper than I think it would be for most people but um what made what I had so terrifying I mean aside from the fact that it was potentially fatal <laughs> was the fact that even if they successfully saved me. Even if they could get in and remove the sarcoma, 
there was a very high risk that I would never speak again. And so for someone who's always loved storytelling and speaking and does voiceover for a living, it was doubly, triply more traumatic. And it sounds very, I think, immature probably because it's, it's obviously life is a gift even with or without certain blessings. But I, at the time, desperately felt like if I, if I was never going to speak again, I just didn't want to survive because it would be like taking away my passion, what I loved. And, um, that was really terrifying. The idea of waking up, never able to move my face again and not able to speak, um, which is also my livelihood and not just my love, but my livelihood. So I guess if there's anything that anybody can picture that they love doing, that's their reason for living and they could possibly live, but they would never do it again um, or have the ability to, to make their living again. That's kind of what I was facing. And um, it, when I was through the surgery and we knew at least that I had the potential to speak again with um, rehabilitation and speech therapy, it became the most motivational carrot in the world. Um, it, it literally was my reason for getting up in the morning and my reason for continuing to heal was I desperately wanted to be able to do voiceover again and speak again. Yeah, it, it's it's completely what I understand what uh, you've been through. I had the same with like, I was in a wheelchair and I also had to um, go to a rehabilitation center in order to learn how to walk and bike and swim. And every morning I woke up as well. It's like, okay, I you know, I have the possibility to get better and to do this. And that really motivated me to, uh, to always like stay happy as well and to, to, to keep going and, uh, and all that sort of thing. So yeah, I totally get what you're saying. Well, I definitely didn't stay. Ha I wouldn't say it, that it motivated me to stay happy, but, um, I, cause I think those were the most terrifying, um, scary months of my life, not knowing if I would be able to do this again. Um, the other thing is that it became not only a motivation in terms of, I think I started to recognize as I was trying to teach myself to speak again, that maybe there was, it was the beginning of the idea for me that maybe if I got back my ability to speak, that I should be focused on other things, not just would I ever do video games again? Mm -hmm. uh, not that there's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a amazing thing to make a living at and I love it. And it requires a lot of skills that skill sets that took years to learn and that, um, are, are like any skill set, any, any art artistry, it's got layers to it. And so I don't mean to disrespect it at all by saying, you know, not to not just return to doing video games or cartoons or TV commercials, but I think it woke up for me the idea that maybe, uh, if I learned to speak again, maybe there was more to life that I should start opening up my heart to not just being always about the next job or the next audition. Uh, it was very, it's very easy in Los Angeles in particular, uh, to get completely, uh, ensconced in this feeling that all that matters is continuing to thrive at your job. So, um, yeah, I think that, I think it was a, certainly a mixed blessing what I went through. I would never use a cliche like, well, I'm really grateful to cancer because it taught me so much because I don't really feel that way. I, I feel like it would have been great if I never went through what I went through. Um, maybe that's because I'm still learning all the lessons from it, but I certainly did come away with a much greater perspective on, um, other possibilities. And as you now know, you know, other things that I could do with my voice and being able to talk, uh, which became so much of what I'm doing now to try to help others and, and be there to help others feel less lonely and to face whatever difficulties they're going through on the dark side of cancer, as well as being a patient advocate. Yeah. So. 
definitely because um i saw that you did a ted talk uh, about not being productive while you know before cancer you were like super focused on being productive and stuff um so so what really made you decide to actually do a ted talk about that well um i i had been very fortunate to i hadn't spoken to anybody about what i had gone through. I managed to make it through approximately six and a half, seven years from the time of diagnosis through everything, all the torment and the hard healing and the multiple surgeries and the radiation and the illnesses without really anybody in Hollywood um, knowing what I had gone through. And um, I think basically I just um, hit a wall in terms of that loneliness. And there were certain things that I was feeling that felt like maybe I should share this. Maybe it will help other people understand why I'm particular about X, Y, Z, or why this scares me or why this is more challenging for me, or just share the ton of emotions and experiences that I had gained from all of this. And I was really struggling with whether or not I should share any of it because I'd made the decision and had been sort of um, not bullied, but pressured into not sharing what I was going through by certain people in Hollywood that I worked with, some of my representatives who felt that it was important as a female that I not let on that I was vulnerable or sick because it could uh, potentially hurt my ability to work. This is before the surgery. Um, you know, don't, don't share this with your agents. Don't share this with producers. Don't, don't let anybody know because maybe they'll be afraid to cast you. And again, this is way before the Me Too movement. This is back in 2012, 2013. And, uh, and so I made the decision to keep silent and hide everything I was going through. And that's a very lonely decision. I'll never really know if it was the right decision because, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and who knows what would have happened if I had shared it, especially because I didn't know what was going to happen after the surgery. I didn't know if I was going to have a voice again or be permanently disfigured. And so, um, after years and years of silence and years and years of going through all of that pretty much without anybody around me knowing what I truly was feeling or what I'd gone through. When the opportunity came from this major newspaper, uh, the Daily News, when they reached out and said, we, we've heard from some people that you work with about your extraordinary story. Do you want to put it on record? Do you want to share it with the world? I really, on the one hand, was desperately happy to finally not live in secrets and silence and to finally say everything, you know, to finally let it out, but also very scared about what the repercussions might be if all these people in Hollywood now knew what I'd gone through and that I had had to work hard to get my voice back, that, it, you know, that I was someone who'd gone through all of that illness and surgeries and wasn't perfect. And, um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of deep life lessons in all of what I just shared and a lot of things that people can extrapolate from that. But when I had the opportunity finally in 2019, uh, it was literally almost a, a year ago that I sat down with the daily news to share my story. It was really extraordinary to, um, finally speak all these things out loud. And then I started to realize as I was doing that, that there was really something, maybe there was something of value that I really had to share for people who were going through this. And then suddenly I realized that I wanted to be somebody that hopefully helped other people feel less terrified and less alone. Um, we, most of us as human beings, at least in America, we feel somewhat alone anyway. Um, no matter how crowded the city or how many friends or whether we're married or dating or whatnot, there's always a feeling of 
nobody really understands me. I think that underlies a lot of people. And illness just magnifies that, you know, a million times. You feel like you're the only person going through what you're going through and that nobody understands and that you're just so cut off from both yourself and what you're used to thinking of yourself, but also the world around you. It's so isolating and obviously so ironic. I don't know when this is going to air, but if it's any time around the time of the quarantine uh, and the coronavirus, now the world is experiencing, in a way, what people with serious illnesses experience all the time. And um, it, it was an unusual experience in 2019 to finally share my story. And then right on the heels of the article, uh, UCLA, which is a, a huge university in America, a very prestigious university, uh, gave me the honor of offering me to do a TED talk um, about what I'd been through and and what my experience had taught me about their theme for the year. TED talks always have a theme for that particular uh, year, and last year was time. So their question to me was, do you feel your experience and your life journey has given you a unique lens on how to view time? And uh, yeah, so that's <laughs> that's what led to the TED Talk. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm very happy and um, that I saw it because I feel like I wasted a lot of time personally because I was very overwhelmed with everything that happened uh, and career choices and everything for, I don't know, the last... Well, I mean, I, I did go to college, so that's good, I guess. But um, I, I was very overwhelmed and I felt really beating myself up over like, oh, my God, I wasted so much time, uh, you know, dealing with mental stuff and like not being able to choose and have a day schedule and everything. And when I re when I saw your TED talk, I was like, oh, my, you know, I could find some peace for myself. And I really see a lot of um, a lot of stories where people feel like, you know, I don't know if I should share my cancer story because you know, what kind of impact it's going to have either on my career or on my relationships. And um, I'm just so happy that you share that finally and that you are able to share that and, you know, to be able to inspire so many other people because it's, it, it's so important to talk about this, um, you know, especially with the mental health stuff going on. I think that's, yeah, I'm very happy you, you know, do the work you do uh, beside the voice acting. It's really nice. Thank you. Which advice would you give uh, to healing people from cancer who uh, feel pressured um, to feeling like they, sh they should be more productive? Well, you know, when they're dealing either with fatigue or being too tired. But um, yeah, do, do you have any advice for that? For uh, cancer patients who are um, in treatment or, or dealing with their particular illness? Yes, either uh, cancer patients or dealing or people who are just done with treatment who feel like, well, I really need to go back to work now and I really need to start living my life. But, you know, maybe I should actually take it easy. Do you have any advice for, for that? I guess the word advice for me, I, sh I guess I shy away from it because I don't think, I don't, I mean, first of all, nobody's really an expert on what anybody else should feel. Um I don't think there is a should everybody's individual and our lives are our gift, you know, to ourself and, and a gift from the universe and everybody is different. So I don't feel like there's a cookie cutter uh, guidance because everybody's different and everybody's situation is different. Um, but I, I guess if the question is what thoughts do you have or input could you give someone from your experience if they're feeling like they should be more productive, like they want to be more productive or they're feeling it's important that they be more productive, but they're still struggling with either the um, direct um, symptoms of treatment or the indirect ones, which are the hidden disabilities that come with uh, having gone through serious illness and treatment. Yeah. Um, hidden disabilities, meaning circumstantial depression, um, feeling you know, lost, feeling displaced from your own life, all these understandable feelings that come with having, you know, certainly I experienced them losing traction with where you were prior to the illness and now trying to come back to life 
and uh, and it's different. So it's different as an understatement. You're you're also dealing with all these other new things, per, perhaps from what you've been through. So I guess what I would offer is to really try to talk to yourself. I, I think of it as talking yourself down from the ledge to really be honest with yourself, look in the mirror or r type on, you know, on your computer or write in a journal how you're feeling, what you're really feeling, what your fears really are, and try to face them. Um, Americans don't do so well with that. I'd like to think other cultures do a bit better with that, but try to be as self-aware as you can muster the courage to be and try to be honest with yourself about why you feel you're not doing the things that you believe you should or want to be doing. And once you kind of identify what those things are, whether it's fear of failure, fear of not being as good as you used to be, fear of not having the energy to do the things you want to do, fear of sucking, <laughs> fear of um, not wanting to do the things you used to want to do. I mean, that's one of the things about life is we do grow and change and deep trauma or serious illness can do that, um, really force changes in turn in terms of our ourselves, things that we used to love, we no longer care about or things that we used to, um, find boring or, you know, not important. Suddenly we realize the value in. So if you can take a moment to address and answer those things that are coming up for you, when you try to do something you feel you want to, or should be doing, that's at least a, a baby step towards, opening up a conversation with yourself and at least addressing what's coming up for you. And then once you know what that is, maybe you're in a better position to then figure out. Um, I always use the term reverse engineer, but to, to take baby steps towards some answer towards it. So not to be all big, but for example, let's say you used to love um, going out and partying and going to clubs not that that's productive, but <laughs> uh, let's say you used to love doing that and now you're coming back from having a serious illness and your friends are inviting you to go out and part of you really wants to because that's what you used to love to do, but part of you is just feeling tired and like you don't want to. It may be worth it to ask yourself, is it just because I'm tired or maybe deep down I don't really want to be around a whole bunch of people shoving and pushing and drinking and loud music. And maybe that's just not appealing to me anymore. Or if it is still appealing and you do really want to do it, but you're feeling tired. Okay. Well then how do I deal with the exhaustion? Maybe it's, maybe I need to have a conversation with a, you know, maybe my doctor, or maybe your nutritionist, or maybe, Something needs, maybe something's changed in my body that I need to address and figure out so that I have the energy to do the things that I want to do. Um, it could be a lot of things that are going on for why you no longer feel up to doing the things you used to do or feel that you should be doing. But I don't think there's a cookie cutter answer because it could be something, t feeling tired or feeling worn out can often be, um, the first layer in something else deeper that's going on for us as to why we don't want to do something. So, and so, sometimes it is just that we're tired because our bodies are worn out and they've been through hell. Um, and that's obviously not only okay and understandable, but 100% one's right to feel. And you just have to try to figure out a way to embrace that and address it so that slowly you can find more energy slowly as your body heals and continues to put itself back together. I've been told um, by both my surgeon and other doctors that when the body goes through major trauma, major trauma being defined as you are displaced from your life. It's not just you were sick for a couple of weeks and oh, that sucks, and I missed my birthday party, but now I'm back to life. Major trauma is something that waylays you and removes you from your own life and where you cannot do the things that you used to do for a long period of time. 
and maybe have the threat of never doing some of the things you used to do again. That's what trauma is defined as and what serious illness often brings with it. And I've been told that it's not unusual for it to take the body uh, as long as seven to nine years to heal through major surgeries, major treatments. Um, the body doesn't just snap back. Now, of course, the younger you are, the quicker that all is because, of course, the body, the cells, everything's much, much fresher and better able to heal when you're younger. So that's part of it, too. But um, it's not unusual. Three years out of cancer, five years out of cancer, even eight years out of it, to still be experiencing certain symptoms um, if the body's still healing itself. But again, that's individual and probably something someone can explore with their own doctor about what might be going on for them. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> sure. Um, so you do still like a lot of motivational speeches, right? Uh, well, I think the term, in all, the term in America is motivational speaking. Oh, and okay. Yeah. And uh, basically uh, talk, you know, you do, you go out on a keynote speaking, doing talks. Um, I'm just at the very beginning of that journey, feel very grateful to be at the beginning of that journey. Uh, it's like every other uh, profession. It requires really building up to a career in that. I feel really honored that people have had me professionally speak um but i'm just sort of at the at the uh very lucky fortunate beginning of it where because of my hollywood uh credits and my very unusual survival story that's tied in with what i do for a living you know almost losing my voice and ability to speak and fighting hard to get all that back so that i could speak again for a living um i feel lucky that i've had as much as i've done in the past um eight months since the TED talk the the TED talk was really the kicking, the kicking off point for that. And that was just in, um, May of last year. So it's really only been about, uh, eight or nine months. <laughs> so I've been lied in those eight or nine months, but I have, uh, a lot more in front of me in terms of being fortunate enough to speak to people. My big passion right now, um, is helping people feel less alone and less uh, frightened from whatever their diagnosis is because I, I know firsthand what that feels like. And I know um, both what it feels like to be told you may never live uh, and also what it feels like to then wonder if once you come back to life, if you're going to want to still be alive, if you're going to lose so much that you loved doing before because what the surgery or treatments may do to you, to you. So, um, I really want to be out there, um, hopefully as some sort of a token or s example of someone who was able to come through all that intact and pick up the pieces slowly and figure out how to navigate forward to live again. Part of my journey also was that the healthcare companies didn't, the health insurance did not want to pay for certain things that they really were obligated to pay for, but they, as health and as healthcare companies can do, tried to find loopholes for reasons that they shouldn't cover certain things because it was in my face, uh, versus other parts of my body. So they were coding things as if it was elective, superficial surgery as if I was just trying to fix my face, you know, to make it look younger or something like that. And, uh, that's been part of my journey too, is taking on that, you know, the medical institutions and the healthcare, um, insurance that tries to not pay or that doesn't pay what they should when someone has faithfully, you know, been paying their premiums and are part of a health insurance plan. So I've been doing patient advocacy and that's another one of my passions is making sure that if anybody needs treatment and they're covered, that they uh, have the ability 
to get the coverage that they deserve. Wow, that's that's crazy because um, I, I hear a lot of stories from America where like the insurance company is really not helpful in you know your recovery or healing process, and I didn't even know that that was possible that they could do that. So, wow. Yeah, I know in other countries it's not it's not uh, anywhere close to that kind of a a challenge. I guess there's you know there's some really wonderful things about the American culture and there's some really crappy things about <laughs> how how it's been set up, but it's def- health insurance is definitely a business in America. Uh they're they're independent corporations that aren't at all tied with the government. And so therefore like most American corporations, they're just mostly focused on making a profit. That makes me really sad. You know, it's, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's the way it's set up. And I, I don't, again, we've got some great things in terms of what it is to be an American. So I certainly don't, you know, it's, it's a give and take. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities here and amazing abilities to progress in careers that you want. And so there's some really outstanding things that come with the culture, but that's one of the downsides of it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. So where can people reach out to you um, on social media or do you have a website? I do. Um, I have Twitter, which is just my name. So it's at Kat Cressida, Cat with a K, Cressida with a C. You can just Google it for the correct spelling. Um, but so it's Cat Cressida on Twitter. On uh, Instagram, it's the same, Cat Cressida. And on Facebook, it's got a dot between my first name and my last name. Okay, awesome. I will also put all your links uh, in this description down below and your um, your links to all the work you do and your TED Talk so people can, you know, learn more about you and stuff. Uh, I think that'd be good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Kat, for like, you know, talking to me and sharing your story. Um, you know, I really appreciate it. And I love learning from uh, from everything, you know, you've been through and you're still going through and all the work you do. So honestly, thank you so much for joining the uh, the podcast for me. It's been my honor, really. And to anybody who's listening, who's uh, taking on their own journey with regards to healing, just really, really, really try hard to be as forgiving of everything that you're feeling and everything that's going on because uh, you deserve to feel whole and you deserve to heal through it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you guys. I will see you in the next episode. Uh, if you want to contact me, go to instagram.com slash the Fabulous Cancer Podcast and have a really nice day.